भोगीलाल लहरचंद इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ इंडोलॉजी की तरफ से समायोजीमान इस व्याख्यान श्रृंखला में आप सभी का हार्दिक स्वागत है आज संचालन का दायित्व मुझे दिया गया है क्योंकि हमारे आदरणीय निदेशक महोदय यात्रा में हैं तो उन्होंने मुझे कहा था कि आप इसका संचालन करेंगे ये मेरा सौभाग्य है कि मैडम डॉक्टर पवन जैन जी के इस व्याख्यान श्रृंखला का संचालन मुझे करने का मौका मिला है आप सभी जानते हैं कि 12 मार्च से 12 व्याख्यान की श्रृंखला में आज चौथा व्याख्यान है मैडम पवन जैन जी का फिफ्थ है सर हाँ पांचवा व्याख्यान है तो मैं भी इस जूम में पंजीकृत हूँ लगातार व्याख्यानों को मैं भी सुनता आ रहा हूं एक ऐसा कार्य डॉक्टर पवन जैन जी ने इसको इस तरह से समायोजित किया है व्याख्यानों को तो एक से एक श्रृंखला जुड़ी हुई है इस श्रृंखला के माध्यम से यदि हम जैन चित्रकारिता चित्रकला पर यदि हम समझना चाहें समग्र रूप से तो इन व्याख्यानों का हमें भरपूर लाभ मिल सकता है मैडम डॉक्टर पवन जैन जी के बारे में कुछ ज्यादा मुझे कहने की आवश्यकता नहीं है आप एक सशक्त हस्ताक्षर हैं जैन समाज के लिए नहीं बल्कि जैन समाज से बाहर भी सभी लोगों के लिए क्योंकि आपका काम इतना विस्तृत है तो इसको मैं कहता चलूं तो बड़ा समय लगेगा अब क्योंकि मैं एक दो बात कहकर मैडम जी से निवेदन अनुरोध करूंगा व्याख्यान देने के लिए क्योंकि आज का जो विषय है कल्प सूत्र पर है कल्प सूत्र पर तथापि इलेट्रेटेड पेंटिंग्स फ्रॉम गुजरात विषय मैडम ने लिया है तो ये वस्तुतः कल्प सूत्र आचार्य भद्रबाहु के द्वारा रचित माना जाता है और आचार्य भद्रबाहु आप सभी जानते हैं भगवान महावीर के प्रथम गणधर के रूप में माने जाते हैं वस्तुतः कल्प सूत्र एक अद्भुत सूत्र ग्रंथ है जिसमें पार्श्वनाद और महावीर की जीवनियां शामिल हैं तो इसको पर्यूषण के त्योहारों पर इसका वाचन किया जाता है जैन भिक्षुओं के द्वारा क्योंकि जैन धर्म का एक आध्यात्मिक मूल्य को बताने वाला एक सर्वश्रेष्ठ ग्रंथ है कल्पसूत्र तो इस कल्पसूत्र में गुजरात में उपलब्ध चित्रकला यानी हस्तलिखित पांडलिपियों में जो चित्रकला है उसके बारे में आज मैडम जी का व्याख्यान है हम सभी आतुर हैं कि गुजरात में उपलब्ध इस चित्रकला के हस्तलिखित चित्रकला पर कल्प सूत्र के बारे में क्या क्या विषय वर्णित है चित्रकला में तो इस विषय सुनने के लिए हम आतुर हैं तो मैं ज्यादा न कहते हुए उपस्थित सभी इस जून जूम के माध्यम से उपस्थित सभी हमारे विद्वजनों का मैं हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूं क्योंकि एक बारह व्याख्यानों की श्रृंखला है तो हम क्रमेण मैडम के इलेस्ट्रेशन से और उनके वचन से उनके प्रेरणा से हम लाभान्वित हो रहे हैं तो मैं सादर अनुरोध करूंगा मैडम डॉक्टर पवन जैन जी से कि वो अपना व्याख्यान से हमें कृतार्थ करें thank you sir thank you very much and uh, yes okay ओके, 
So as uh, professor has just introduced about Kalp Sutra, I will take on from there and further elaborate. First, we'll talk about what Kalp Sutra is, and then we will look at uh, some of the paintings and illustrations which are uh, present in these uh, manuscripts. Okay, so what is a Kalp Sutra? And uh, we discussed earlier about the Jain Agamas, you know. So they are divided into uh, Purvas, Angas, Angabayas, etc. So one of the Angabayas, which is the Cheda Sutra, you no, know, they are six in number and uh, on and which talk about the monastic conduct and uh, behavior of ascetics. So out of these six texts, it is said that three have been written by Bhadrabahu in around uh, 300 BC. Yeah, we don't have the exact date with us, but yeah, that's the approximate date. And uh, it is the uh, Dashrut Skanda. Okay, the eighth chapter is known as Pajo Savan Kalp or alternatively Pajo Saman Kalp. Okay, Pajo Savan is translated as Paryushan, a word used in two somewhat uh, different uh, senses. One is to spend the rainy season at one specific place and the other is the forgiveness. Okay. And the name also suggests a very well-known uh, Jain festival called uh, Paryushan Saman. Uh, and Kalpa means, it means conduct or propriety, right behavior, uh, moral duty prescribed in ascetic rules, etc. And the uh, both together, Pajyosavan Kalpa, which then consequently will mean what? Uh, conduct appropriate during the rainy season or rain rest. And Pajyosavan Kalpa will mean uh, conduct governed by uh, forgiveness. Okay. So uh, this, of course, then later came to be uh, known as the uh, just Kalp Sutra or Paryushan Kalpa. Okay. So, along with the biography of the Jinnas and Jain genealogy, it also gives the details of the conduct of the sadhus in Sadhu Samachari, the last part of the Kalp Sutra. And it is being recited in many temples during Paryushan and uh, celebrated as Samvatsari. You know? So it has developed into an independent text now. Okay. Which, I mean, nobody talks about the Cheda Sutras or the, you know, earlier uh, parts uh, from where it has been taken, right? It is just uh, a very well-known uh, text by itself. Okay. So Kalp Sutra, mainly it is in prose. When I say prose, it means And it has been divided into 291 sutras or Mm, paragraphs. It has three distinct uh, sections, each with a uh, different subject matter. I think I spoke about it in my earlier lecture. Jincharit, Stavirvali, and Sadhu Samachari. So Jincharit, of course, covers uh, 200 sutras and it describes the lives of Tirthankars. In, it begins with uh, Mahavir Swami and goes back to Arhat Rishabh, the very first Tirthankar. Uh, attention is focused on what have been called the five uh, prime events or the Panchkalyanakas of their lives, namely uh, Garb, Janma, Diksha, Gyan, and finally Moksha or Nirvana. Uh, names of the chief uh, family members of these, uh, you know, Tirthankars are also given in this. And then, uh, of course, the life of Mahavir has been uh, shown in more details than the others. And not only does this section contain a detailed uh, uh, description or account of the these five, uh, you know, auspicious events, but also the episode of transfer of embryo of Mahavir from one womb to the another uh, at the instruction of Indra. Some episodes from Parshva's life, Arishnemi and uh, Rishabh are also described in this uh, Kalp Sutra. So the author of Kalp Sutra says that the events in the lives of uh, remaining 20 Tirthankars should be taken as being exactly the same as those described in the case of Mahavir, uh, just except for the 
um, transfer of embryo. Okay, uh, that incidence which is not present in uh, any other Tirthankar's life. Okay. So we will today look at all the beautiful uh, paintings that have come down to us in the form of Kalp Sutra from the region of Gujarat. So the Kalp Sutra has been held in a very, very, in a position of special honor, I would say, among the Shvetambar Jains of all communities. Okay. And the, for the purpose of uh, public recitation, it was necessary that a copy be made available to every watcher or an orator who gives a, a public uh, recitation. Okay. So as a result, uh, devotees commissioned innumerable copies huh, of the work. Hundreds of Kalp Sutras were uh, copied, prepared over a period ranging from almost 11th to 18th century and are available in different libraries and uh, temples also. Okay. So, Kalp Sutra is one text which is most uh, prolifically, I would say, illustrated amongst the Shvetambar Jains. And we find maximum illustrated copies of the text. No other text has these kind of uh, rich illustrations as compared to a Kalp Sutra. They are very rich in illustration and constitute a major part of, uh, I will not hesitate to say, gen the entire, you know, uh, I would say, uh, the whole uh, body of work of Kalp Sutra, you know, maximum Jain paintings you will find in this. So the manuscript earlier I showed you, the palm leaf manuscripts, we show, I showed you a lot of images of Saraswati, no? the fir very first folio. And I'd, I had also mentioned that it also starts with the Namokar Mantra in the beginning of the text with here, here you can, if you uh, care to read with me, here you can read the Namukar Mantra is written here and very clearly you can read it. And along with that, you can see uh, Tithankar Mahavir is sitting in Pushpotar heaven before descending down on earth. He had lived there for a period of almost uh, 20 uh, Sagarupmas. So, what is that? That is a unit of time, which is really very, very large. His time there had now run its full course and he descended to this land of Bharatvarsh, situated in Jambudvi. Okay. So I think I spoke about the earlier lives also of the Thankars, you know, in my earlier lecture of Parshanath also and Shantinath, etc. So similarly, before descending down on earth, Avir Swami was stationed at the Pushpotar uh, heaven. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, yes. So, this is the Garb Kalyanak we are looking at. Uh, but uh, we know that the story of transfer of embryo is there in case of Mahavir Swami. So, in the month of Ashar, in fact, uh, on the sixth day of bright moon, which means uh, Shukla Paksha, no? He was conceived into the womb of Devananda. Huh. Who was Devananda? Uh, uh, you know, Brahmani or a Brahmani woman of Jalandhar Gotra. Okay. She was the wife of Rishabdat, a Brahmin of the Ikshvaku clan and Kodala Gotra, it is said, who lived in the Brahmin sector of the town of Kundalgram. We all know that's the birthplace of Mahavir. Na? So, Garb Kalyanak, here you can see, with here you can see uh, Brahmani Devananda, and here you can see the 14 auspicious dream. In fact, there are 12 of them here, and two of them are here. Sun and the moon are, you know, moved onto this side for the, you know, because uh, there was not enough space. So, some kind of adjustment the artist has done here. Okay. So, this I'm trying to show it's a very rich folio where the entire folio, there is no text. It's just the image which is there. So here you can see Indra Sabha where one finds all kinds of um, musicians, dancers, courtiers enjoying. Uh, and here you can see Indra is shown four-armed here. So I think we all know this, that it is only these uh, lesser, I, if, I, if I may be permitted to say, gods and goddesses, some yakshis, the, uh, you know, shasan devtas, etc. They are shown multi-armed or, you know, multi-faced. You know, 
but never the Tirthankar, okay, because they were born as human beings like you and me, okay. So why am I showing you this? So Indra kept a constant watch over the uh, continent of Jambudvi with his uh, all-embracing, super-sensory and almost um, omniscient vision. Huh? He saw that Shraman Mah uh, Mahavir had entered the womb of Devananda, who was the wife of Rishabdath, who lived in the land of Bharat and was filled with joy and contentment and bliss. Okay. But uh, what happens? Then hurriedly, he, you know, climbs down the footstool of his throne and he removes uh, his shoes. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, it is said that they were beautifully studded with all kinds of gems, etc. And, of course, uh, he, you know, kind of puts his shawl over his left shoulders with palms folded from, a, uh, you know, to form an Anjali Mudra. He took seven steps in the direction of the Tirthankar. Then bending his left knee forward, as you can see in the illustration also, and placing his right knee on the ground, uh, he thrice touched the floor with his forehead. Okay. Having done this, he lifted his, you know, arms and joined his palms together, all ten fingers touching, and placed them on his forehead in a gesture of reverence. And he addressed the Tirthankar thus. Okay. That, yeah, uh, uh, he offers his obeisance to the uh, Tirthankar there. Okay. And this is how then he pays his, uh, you know, uh, respects. All right. With these words, Indra paid homage to Shaman Mahavir and uh, facing east, he resumed his seat on the throne. Okay. Then what happens? Indra, the supreme god, of course, he, uh, uh, in fact, he came to know about this uh, conceivement of Mahavir in Brahmani rather than a Kshatrani uh, Trishla. So with deep concern and he formed a resolution that it has never happened, it cannot happen and it will never happen. That an Arhat or a, a Chakravarti, a Baldev or a Vasudev, you know, these are, uh, we all know the 63 uh, great men, you know will be born in minor clan or a fringe clan or a lowly destitute or a miserly clan, as we can call them, a clan of beggars or of brahmanas. So this is how brahmanas have been described in uh, Jain texts. Uh, Visabhis, whereas amongst the four varnas, amongst the Hindus, they are the uh, uppermost in the hierarchy. Oh, no. This is, uh, you know, so he says that... Uh, now, it is an established practice, you know, among Indras, past, present and future, to see that the embryo of the Arhat is taken from the womb of a woman belonging to a minor clan to, and to be transferred to the womb of a Kshatriya woman. And okay. So, uh, he kind of, uh, you know, uh, calls the god Haringameshi, the god of infantry. I spoke about him earlier also. Okay. Uh, so he says that I should have the uh, womb of uh, Mahavir transferred from one, uh, you know, womb to the, uh, transfer the embryo from one womb to the other. Okay. And once he has formed this resolution, uh, Harin Garameshi comes, India, uh, you know, Indra's ambassador and chief of infantry. And in fact, this god was also popularly, uh, you know, worshipped during Vedic times also. And it was believed that he had the power to uh, bestow children. He was also known as Naigameshin or Naigama and apprised him. Uh, Indra told him about his thoughts. And uh, of course, he narrated the whole story. And he said that this is what you are supposed to be doing. And after, you know, paying his respects to Indra, then he moves from there. Okay. So here you can see. Uh, Harin Gameshi, when is you know on its on the move, uh, he directly goes to the house of Rishabdatta in the Brahmin sector of the town of Kundalgram, and ke then came comes to uh, Devnanda's room, and here he has extracted the uh, you can actually see a very very realistic representation of the embryo. I mean, it's almost uh, exactly the same size 
and color also. Huh? He first he offers his veneration and then he you know takes out this from the womb of uh, Brahmani Devananda. Okay, and he asks leave uh, from Mahavir and he goes to uh, Trishla there. Okay, so this is another folio. I'm trying to show you very many different manuscripts. So you will also get uh, uh, sometimes different color schemes also and very slight difference you will find because as I have repeatedly been telling you that Gujarati paintings or these Jain paintings were very, very, uh, you know, hieratic in nature in that sense that they barely made any changes in terms of the way these paintings were made. Okay. Then he comes and hypnotizes Trishla and her attendants into a deep sleep. Huh? And having removed unholy particles, showered holiness upon them, then he gently places a Mahavira in the womb of Trishla. He then removed the child that lay in Trishla's womb and carried it to the womb of Devananda. And this is how uh, this transfer of embryo uh, of Mahavir uh, takes place. Okay. So then why am I showing you this, uh, you know, uh, this is another, uh, you know, painting in the same Kalp Sutra, whereby now we are looking at uh, Trishla's 14, uh, you know, auspicious dreams that she sees. Okay. Uh, so in that night, on that night, when uh, Mahavir's uh, embryo was placed inside her womb, uh, she lies half asleep in her bed chamber. The interior of her room was painted with all kinds of murals, etc., etc. And she sees these uh, 14 auspicious dreams, elephant, a bull, lion, uh, goddess Shri, a pair of garlands, moon, sun, a flag, uh, then, uh, you know, a poon, a kalash with eyes, a lotus pond, a milky ocean, a, you know, a viman or a celestial, you know, vehicle, a heap of jewels and, uh, you know, a smokeless fire. You know? So these are the 14 dreams that she sees then. Of course. So this is the detail I'm trying to show. Probably not today. Another time when we, I can, I will also explain to you the uh, meaning of all the uh, uh, auspicious 14 dreams. What did they mean? Okay. okay. So once Trishla sees these dreams, this is the, you know, painting whereby she's narrating her dreams to her husband, King Siddhartha. Huh? After this very, very befitting, uh, you know, uh, dream vision, Trishla woke up with very, very happy heart. Uh, she walked to the couch where Siddhartha was, uh, you know, sleeping. Very gently, she wakes him up and then, with uh, you know, she uh, takes her seat and uh, then she narrates, like, uh, her, you know, in her sweet and very, very amiable voice, she said that, Today, my Lord, I have seen... While I was sleeping on my comfortable couch, I saw 14 wondrous and beautiful dreams. She then recounted uh, the object she had seen in her dream vision. Okay. On hearing Trishla's words, King Siddhar was actually transported with joy. He reflected on the uh, significance of the dreams in the light of his inborn wisdom and acquired knowledge, whatever that he knew about them. And then uh, next morning, in fact, this is also uh, the same scene I'm showing you from another manuscript. Okay, so principally it is the same thing. Uh, just some decorations will be changed, the textile patterns, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, will be different. You know. Okay. So uh, next day, when you know. Uh, at the time of sunrise, King Siddhartha rose from his bed. He climbed down from the footstool and walked down to his gymnasium. Anna, like all of us do in the mornings. We do all kinds of exercises, etc., etc., yoga. So here you can see a scene of his uh, gymnasium, right? Or Vyayam Shala, as we call it. All right. And he applied himself to various, you know, wholesome exercises, high jump, athletic jaws, wrestling. When tired and fatigued, he lay down on the uh, mat of oil skin and was massaged very uh, by very, very uh, skillful masseurs and 
uh, yeah, who were very well trained and accomplished experts. Okay. They were strong limbed, but had very soft hands and feet, etc. This is the description that the Kalp Sutra says. So here, as I had spoken earlier also, sometimes the subject matter of the pa painting will also spill over the uh, border decorations. Huh? Like how here you can see the you know wrestling is happening between the two, right, etc. So this also uh, is reminiscent about we talk about the Mughal influence no, on Jain paintings, but these are much earlier to uh, Jain paintings, the Hashiyas that we uh, you know, come across. But uh, as I always say that not a uh, few things we will see in later paintings, which do exhibit Mughal paintings, uh, you know, uh, influence, but definitely not uh, these, you know, border paintings. These are very much, uh, pretty much, you know, uh, the very original, uh, you know, features of Jain paintings. Then this is another folio uh, from uh, another uh, uh, Jain Kalp Sutra, which is again illustrated. So here you can see the king and the queen seated in the border folios and of course the gymnasium here. Okay. So Siddhartha then uh, straight went to his bath chamber from the gymnasium and the chamber was adorned with all kinds of pearls its floor was checkered with mosaic of uh, precious stones etc etc and it uh, had uh, luxurious uh, bathing pavilions where a bathing stool uh, studded with gems and decorated with rows of paintings had been placed so he sits down on that stool comfortably and took a pleasant and beneficial bath with a clear and pure water which was warm, perfumed, and flower fragrant. And after that, yeah, you can see him looking in the mirror here. Do you see this mirror here? Uh, yeah. And at the back, there is an attendant who's combing his uh, long hair, which is not, so. sometimes you will find them, you know, tied into a bun, right? Here, yeah, of course, he's come out of his bath. So you're looking at this. And of course, the huge canopy above his head, the parrots all talk about, uh, about the, uh, the regional uh, preferences or the uh, local culture of the you know of that time the uh, parrots are of course the local birds and this uh, huge canopies uh, you can still find uh, in the region of Gujarat. Then this is also the same scene from another Kalp Sutra manuscript. No, so after having finished his morning rituals, King Siddharth uh, summons his courtiers to call for the dream diviners or the dream interpreters. All right. So here he's uh, addressing the uh, courtiers here. This is the detail of the same manuscript. Yeah. Folio. Okay. So now the uh, king, you know, narrated the dreams of Devi Trishla. Okay. And of course, the, the king's uh, words gladdened the hearts of the dream diviners. Uh, they began reflecting on the dreams. They ventured uh, interpretations, uh, consulted with each other, discussed, arrived at meanings, and finally came to a conclusion. They addressed the kings, commencing their words of prophecy with an uh, exposition of science of dream diviners, you know, because they were learned people. They were trained in this particular uh, vidya or, you know, science. Yeah. So they say, undoubtedly, uh, Trishla has seen dreams which are uh, most auspicious of a kingdom and the birth of a son after nine months and uh, seven and a half days, your son will be born with perfect limbs uh, manifesting every mark of uh, auspiciousness, they say. And on uh, growing up and on reaching manhood, with a, uh, he will have ripe intellect. Your son will become a valiant hero and a great king. Uh, ruling his kingdom with large armies and numerous carriages. He will be Chakravarti with his dominions and, uh, you know, extending over the four quarters. But, they said, it may also so happen that he will become a great Dharma Chakravarti, Atirthankar, the leader of the world. Truly, O oh, beloved of God, Srishla has seen bountiful dreams, they say, uh, dreams uh, presaging or 
प्रीसेजिंग मतलब प्रेडिक्टिंग है ना अ लॉन्ग लाइफ गुड हेल्थ एंड ऑस्पिशियस प्रोस्पेरिटी फॉर द एंटायर किंगडम सो यह यू कैन सी द फोर ड्रीम डिवाइनर्स यह एंड अगेन यू कैन सी यह सम ऑफ देम सीटेड इन द बॉर्डर्स आल्सो है ना ओके वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सो दिस इज अनदर फोलियो फ्रॉम द actually i'm trying to compare two manuscripts simultaneously and similar scene i'm showing you from the other manuscript the kalp sutra manuscript also okay so trishla's concern and joy uh, actually i have uh, uh, nobody talks about these things uh, we mainly talk about the uh, you know panch kalyanaks but these are some uh, i would say hidden gems inside kalp sutra which you know we get to uh, know and by looking at the uh, illustrations it's very very interesting to collate the text and the painting together okay so what are krishna uh, trishla's uh, joys and concern here so it is said that uh, amongst the shvetambars uh, mainly that mahavir uh, you know who was dwelling in the womb of trishla Uh, with such stillness because he thought that if we made the slightest of movement or even a tremor uh, you know it would cause pain to the mother so therefore he remained without making his presence felt as if he was not there at all he did this out of compassion for his mother hmm. but trishla became very very apprehensive and thought maybe the child in my womb has been destroyed or it is dead or uh, you know it has been killed uh, have i suffered a miscarriage he she, you know she was beginning to get very very concerned because she thought the child used to move but now he doesn't move at all and she became distressed and uh, spiritless at all i mean absolutely and this is the concern she is narrating to her friend and her heart in fact almost sank in a sea of sorrow he you know sits brooding in fact with a cheek on her hands uh, and with eyes fixed to the ground all the merry men uh, you know merry making or multifarious sounds of drums uh, and strings and cymbals of music and dance etc came to a stop suddenly uh, in you know siddhartha's palace and all cheer was gone and everybody was very very sad hmm. okay so of course when mahavir uh, came to know of his mother's concern and apprehension he made a little movement in uh, you know to his side and this of course gladdened the heart of trishla a thrill of joy kind of uh, went you know through her body causing the hair of her body to stand okay uh, of course there are a lot of upmas which are there that as a kadam flower at the touch of the rain how it happens and she kind of exclaimed she shouted the child in my boom is very much live he is safe he has not suffered a miscarriage for my child moves as before she says and her uh, spirits are uh, they are cheered again i would say that so this is the scene which is being shown here hmm. okay then of course this is the janm kalyana at the proper time the proper moment when nine months seven and a half days had passed uh, bha uh, shraman mahavir uh, came forth into the world okay and of course countless gods and goddesses glided uh, you know to an uh, ascending and descending movements the whole world was awed and there arose from the world a mighty uh, i would say uh, tumult of uh, wonder i would say that that's what happened yeah this is a very uh, nice folio from another manuscript very very highly decorative so this is i wanted you to see this this is how the illustrations are placed and that's why they are called the manuscript uh, you know uh, miniature paintings hai na because the size of the paintings are very very small so these are of course the enlarged uh, version that i'm showing you of this very small manuscript here hmm. and of course one can see the uh domestic uh, life here of uh, gujarati household here right here you, at the you know base you can see a spittoon hai right? na 
or ya peak dan hum jisko kehte hain a bed with curved legs which i mean still you can find in uh, gujarat uh, gujarati households okay so of course once the child was born indra takes the baby on mount meru for his first uh, you know lustrous bath and gods of various categories bhavnapatis vyayantaras jyotishkas vaimanikas uh, they anoint the tirthankar and celebrated the glory of his birth here you can see all the different you know devas you know anointing the baby with the different kind of you know fragrant waters uh, scents etc etc and here you can see the peaks of mount meru here at the bottom so very very a pictographic presentation here you can see okay and this is the celebration in the palace uh, at the birth of mahavir uh, in the local term we call it rat jagah hai na in gujarat or rajasthan in fact this is the word which is also used in kalp sutra which happens in the households on any auspicious occasions uh, the women folk get together stay up all night they invoke the various gods and goddesses for the successful culmination of the event and now also we find the same kind of thing happening in during weddings uh, one can witness this so here you can see uh, you know different women are seated here with the you know with different hand postures and uh, exclamations and you can see the dhotis of them there's all are having different kind of uh you know patterns the block prints etc which was a very very uh, thriving industry textile industry of that time the block printing on cottons and same is being reflected in this particular uh, folio hmm. okay this is uh, the same scene i'm trying to show you from another uh, manuscript illustration yeah okay uh once uh, of course mahavir is here yeah, moving on an elephant his domestic life has started education marriage etc and in the lower register what you can see indra again is shown four arms you can recognize him with a halo around him here yeah, yeah. and of course his two courtiers are here who are you know shown in reverence in anjali mudra here and indra is trying to give them some kind of instruction here and he says he discusses with his courtiers that about the uh, greater job at hand that was about uh, about for mahavir which was you know waiting for him you know besides his domestic life which was about Mm, acquiring knowledge and spreading it amongst the people who were living a life of ignorance so that was the greater cause for which he had taken birth isn't it so he sends his uh, you know these devas to remind mahavir about the greater goal of his life yeah so of course now here you can see <clears throat> uh, of course even before uh, mm, he became a householder it is said in kalp sutra that he had the gift of a supreme omniscient and intuitive vision and his uh, you know this uh, vision gave him this uh, you know advanced knowledge about his renunciation all right so when the hour of renunciation came he gave up his all his gold uh, gold ornaments his kingdom his empire uh, you know his uh, imperial armies carriages treasuries warehouses as well as all his towns uh, etc all to all his subjects all right he renounced his immense wealth comprising of different you know i mean whatever that one can think of uh, mother of pearls gold corals rubies all else that was of value and of any kind of uh, consequence okay so he renounced it all with a uh, total indifference huh? and equanimity i would say and had it distributed among the poor and the debt burdened uh, through a proper hands okay so here of course in the painting also you can see the same thing he is distributing here you can see a heap of jewels which are kept on a stand and here you can see a different brahmanas etc who have come to uh, you know partake of this yeah 
And then on the 10th day of the first fortnight, the dark fortnight of the month of Marg, okay, uh, the first month of winter, which is when on that day, uh, he, you know, which is also called the Subrata, huh, nah? the shadows had moved to the east for one whole, you know, man length and the moment was the auspicious moment called Vijaya or success, it, it was called. He left his home on this palanquin or palki also, and which was called Chandra Prabha. Hmm. On his way, he was followed by a huge congregation of gods, men, demons surrounding him, walked many groups of men, some carrying auspicious conches, others carrying weapons like wheels, chakra and plows. Uh, some were uttering auspicious words and others were shout, you know, shouting words of uh, benediction or vardhmanak with him walked all you know his retainers or sorry one second now huh? I'll just take this call one second let me mute myself Yeah, sorry, sorry for that break. Huh? Fine. Okay. So I was discussing about his uh, palanquin, you know, in which he takes, uh, leaves the palace. You know? And of course, there were a lot of uh, uh, musicians, dancers, as you can see here also. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. So this is, of course, the Diksha Kalyana, the third one. Uh, he stopped his palki near the uh, magnificent Ashoka tree and climbed down the carriage. Then he shed all his fineries, his ornaments, etc., etc., and garlands. He plucked out his hair with his fists. Uh, in five handfuls, hana, jisko hum panch mushti ke shlochan kehte hain. And he undertook a vow that he will have only one meal without water. Uh, then when the moon was in conjunction uh, with the constellations, he then became a homeless mendicant, ya, uh, muni ya sadhu, wandering solitary with a lone piece of uh, holy cloth on his person. And he wore this cloth for a year and a month after which he gave up all clothing. He used hands as his only begging bowl. You know, I showed you earlier in one of the paintings uh, where Adinath was shown, you know, uh, accepting the Diksha. Yeah. And then, of course, this, this is, I'm trying to show you the Upsargas, you know, of Mahavir. He cultivated an attitude of, uh, you know, giving up his body, the Uttrishtakaya, and also renouncing the body. Uh, both these attitudes, you know, he cultivated for a period of over 12 years uh, with, uh, you know, forbearance and he endured all kinds of adversities that came his way, whether caused by gods, men or beasts. Adversities both uh, natural and supernatural. He endured them all with compassion, detachment and equanimity. You know? And as and when they arose. So here you can see a wild beast, you know, trying to disrupt his meditation here. You can see two people trying to poke kind of sticks, you know, through his ears here. So all kinds of, uh, you know, difficulties that he had to uh, forbear towards in the path of his uh, enlightenment. This is another scene uh, from the... Uh, from another manuscript that I'm trying to show you, the Upsargas. Here also you can see the same scene that, and there is a, there is a wild animal here, probably a lion here or a tiger here. Yeah. 
So Gyan Kalyanak. And then, of course, uh, Bhagwan Mahavir attained the ultimate uh, knowledge and vision called Keval Gyan, the vision which is final, huh? unimpeded, unveiled, total and all-embracing. Who had been taking only one meal without water in three days was at that time sitting in meditation under a shal tree, right? In the fields of the householder. Okay, and thus, uh, after having attained omniscience, he became an arhat, a jinnah, possessed of all knowing, all seeing, keval gyan. Okay, so a knowledge in which everything that happens in the world is cognized. Okay, uh, this knowledge embraces all time, past, present, future, as well as all states of being uh, conscious or material. Okay, that's right. So, uh, and then after that, of course. Uh, after 12 years of his life on the path to ultimate nirvana, then he attained. Okay, fine. Now I will, would like to talk about something about the Samvasaran also. You know? In the earlier painting also, that was Samvasaran only. So this is the Samvasaran of Mahavir. Uh, the preparation of the assembly hall with, uh, you know, which was prepared by Indra with his entourage of other gods and of, uh, you know, coming from different realms, okay. So, whenever the jinnah exhibits this condition of Kevli, in which all substances manifest themselves, there are princes of air, Vayu Kumars, they cleanse the earth for one yojin all around. The cloud princes, the Megh Kumars, rain down fragrant water, the gods of the season spread heaps of flowers, and the Vanvayantaras make the surface of the earth variegated with all kinds of gems, rubies, gold, etc., etc. At every gate, uh, as you can see, the, there are four gates to the Samvasaran. Uh, there are flags, uh, you know, chatras, parasols, makar torans are, you know, put garlands, mm, uh, poon kalash or the pitchers, uh, you know, a triple arch, etc. They are put with incense vases, you know. It's all very, very fragrant. And so this is what in um, art we show. Uh, this is briefly a, a you know, triple uh, walled enclosure. You can see three walls here uh, for the delivery of the religious discourse by the Jinnah immediately after when he becomes a Kevni. The description of the Sambhasaran is extracted from the Sambhasaran Sthavana. That's the text. Okay. And of course, in the center, there is a, you know, gem studded pedestal uh, with four doors, three steps and as high as the figure of Jinnah, uh, 200 dhanush and long two and a half krosas high from the ground level. So these are all the units of uh, measurement and you know, a distance, which are very, very large. And in the center of the dais uh, stands an Ashoka tree, 12 times as high as the body of the jinnah and exceeding a yojan in, you know, width. Okay. And then underneath there is a pedestal on the east, uh, which, uh, which is called the Devachanda. And on it, four lions, you know, lion thrones are occupied by the jinnah himself on the east. And on the other sides, there are three reflections of, uh, you know, jinnah produced by the Vanvayantaras. Why, you know, why three reflections? Because everybody attending this uh, discourse should be able to see the Tirthankar, you know, from wherever that uh, they are present. Right. <clears throat> and of course, he and sorry, he enters from the east and then he sits uh, facing the congregation, which uh, com uh, comprises of gods, men, animals, etc., etc. There are step wells at each corner. And also it is said that uh, there are animals who are otherwise, you know, uh, uh, enemies of each other are shown, uh, you know, listening to the discourse, uh, sitting with, you know, uh, close proximity. Okay. And of course, there are different uh, <clears throat> thoughts about the discourse, which happens. Uh, uh, the Gumbers think that, you know, he, uh, you know, talks in, uh, uh, you know, in a language which is being understood by everybody. Whereas, you know, uh, Shwetambars think that he uh, speaks, uh, you know, in a monotone and the uh, chief disciples of uh, Mahavid, the Gandhars, 
they kind of collate and then they translate it and put them in the sutra form. Hmm. <clears throat> and on the, you know, when Mahavir, you know, breathed his uh, last, uh, took his last breath and became liberated, reaching a state beyond any kind of pain, uh, many gods and goddesses glided up and down the skies, shedding luster in the dark. And this, I'm talking about the Moksh Kalyanak, the last one. And at the and he goes and you know uh, occupies the place at the top part of the Jain universe. And we will talk about how uh, Jain texts talk about the uh, universe and the Adhaid Veep, etc. The symbol is you know at the top of the universe, this uh, curved. Uh, <clears throat> shape uh, arc, a crystal white, it's called the uh, Isht Pragbhar. Right? Uh, this arc kind of represents the abode of the Siddhas. Uh, it is also known as the Siddhashila. All right, it is the final resting place of the liberated souls. Okay, uh, sometimes you will find uh, when you, you know, when we are doing puja in the temple or uh, many of the Jain symbols, you will find this crescent moon which is the Siddha Shila, and then there is a dot on top. So the dot, you may have noticed this, uh, you know, in the rituals, it represents a Siddha. You know? So next time when you see that dot on the on top of this Siddha Shila, it is representative of a Tirthankar or a Siddha. In order to achieve this stage, a soul must uh, destroy all attached karmas, everything living being uh, should strive for, uh, this state of the salvation or moksha. Okay. So, uh, yeah. With this, uh, <clears throat> there are some uh, other episodes also from the life of Mahavir that I wanted to show you. Or, uh, I don't know. Um, should we take it up in the next lecture if there are any questions now? Or I can continue uh, totally for you. Because uh, it is a very big subject, you know, Kalp Sutra from Gujarat. There are <clears throat> maximum number of illustrations or paintings that I wanted to show you today. But I'm almost only halfway. So probably uh, we can take it up next time or if you want, I can continue it. Uh, sir, aap bataiye. Uh, Ma'am, as, as you wish, um, because uh, uh, listeners, listeners uh, for Chika. Friends, okay. uh, maybe we will continue for listen. another otherwise, uh, other, otherwise, you can catch the next lecture. Uh, okay, uh, we'll talk about it is some up to you. It is up to you. It is up yeah, to you, and then probably we'll uh, conclude. Yeah, so there are some other. Uh, episodes also in Mahavir's life or Neminath's life or Parshanath and Adinath, etc., which are also represented in uh, Kalp Sutra. All right. So most of the folios are concerned with five auspicious events, but these episodes are also present. And these uh, st stories almost run parallel to some of the Hindu legends also, which we will find in the case of Neminath. Okay. So this... Uh, painting that I'm showing you, when Mahavir was uh, just uh, about eight years old, there is somebody who has raised a hand. Should we uh, do it later after I have finished? Yeah. <clears throat> Suvarna ji? Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, of course, there was, uh, you know, one God in the higher heaven where, who became very jealous of Mahavir when Indra kept talking about the uh, steadfastness, uh, you know, <clears throat> about Mahavir. Okay. So once when Mahavir and his friends, they were playing this uh, game of Amlaki or Amli, which was probably uh, similar to the uh, game of tag that we play, you know, which uh, in modern times it's called that. And of course, first the God came and took the form of a snake here to scare away all the, all the boys and Mahavir also. But of course, Mahavir just, uh, you know, kind of uh, picked him up like a rope and threw him to uh, the ground. And this is seen on the right side of the illustration. 
and then the jealous god took the form of the boy who became a playmate here of mahavir you know and the game was that whoever was uh, you know losing uh, that person has to piggyback the uh, that person who was win winning so dear mahavir is shown here and the deva is shown on his shoulder and of course he starts growing in size more and more and of course finally mahavir had to uh, you know put him down on the ground all right so this is in the same painting you can see mahavir shown uh, twice here okay and uh, this kind of uh, you know um, this device of showing this pictorial device is very very common to uh, jain paintings and even in other in other forms of indian art here yeah. so here you can see mahavir is riding the uh, you know god here do you see this and the god who was jealous he started becoming you know bigger and bigger in size uh, and trying to he thought that he's going to harm mahavir but uh, you know the on the contrary it was mahavir who kind of uh, gets hold of the you know evil they were over there <clears throat> So here uh, you can see Parshnath uh, in his, uh, here Kamath you can see and uh, Parshnath here on the horse here. Kamath is performing Panchagni Tap. Uh, of course, Parshva is always associated with the black serpent. And before uh, Parshva's birth also, it is said that his mother saw a black serpent and his chinna is also serpent. And later in life, he is also guarded by the serpent king Dharnendra, who is also his yaksha and who enters in the story in the connection with Kamath here that we are talking about. Okay, so the Parshna Charit, in fact, relates the story of nine free births also of Parshnath and Katha or Kamath. That's another name, who were originally the brothers Marubhuti and Kamath. Okay, and of course, in each story, uh, Marubhuti was, uh, you know, uh, uh, in each story, the Marubhuti is slain by the, you know, latter. All right. Uh, in the final, of course, we know he is born as Meg Malin. And here, when Parshanath sees that there is a snake, uh, you know, ek sarpon ka joda jo tha, wo ek isme lakdi, isme, uh, hua tha, which was being offered in the Havan Kund. And he tries to stop Kamath. And of course, Kamath says, oh, you don't know anything about these, uh, you know, ritualistic practices. And it is only we, the, uh, you know, uh, the yogis, we know about this. And of course, finally, Parshanath has the fire put out and he saves this, uh, uh, these two, you know, uh, the yugal. And of course, in their next birth, they are born as the king of the, uh, snakes, the Dharnendra and his consort, uh, Padmavati. Uh, no. So this is what is being shown here. <clears throat> of course, this is the same scene that I'm trying to show you uh, from another manuscript. And then when, of course, Parshva was meditating in the forest in search of knowledge, the Asur Meghmalin, uh, no, the next birth of Kamath, who has the souls of Kamath, finds Parshva and attacks him with the tigers, elephants, scorpions. And of course, when Parshva doesn't, uh, you know, shows no fear, the animals kind of, you know, move away ashamed. And then, of course, Meghmalin uh, tries to submerge Parshanath in water produced by a, a fearful thunderstorm. But even then, uh, he uh, does not budge from his uh, pious meditations. So while standing in the forest, uh, you know, in Koshambi, in Kayotsar posture, Dharan finds out that through his, you know, su superior uh, insight that Kamath is attacking Parshnath. So, of course, then he arrives, uh, King Dharnendra arrives and protects Parshva for three days from the uh, disturbing elements. And he fashions by means of his serpent hood, you know, like an umbrella on top of his head with Devi Padmavati. Of course, here she's not shown, with, uh, but many paintings you will find Padmavati also holding a chhatra or a uh, parasol, right? And of course, Parshanath uh, stands here like a royal hansa submerged in deep trance. Okay. 
then we talk about some stories uh, about Neminath. Huh, no? uh, here we can see lifting the conch of Krishna in the top register. And here Neminath is defeating Krishna in a uh, duel. Hmm. Events in the life of a Neminath. So Krishna is supposed to be the cousin of Neminath, both hailing from the Girnar region. And Krishna's Panchjanya uh, Shank, you know, which was given to him by Varun, the god of the sea. It was believed that uh, no other person could produce a sound from this, uh, you know, conch. One day Krishna's this cousin, Neminath, saw it lying on the ground and thought it was a toy. And uh, he innocently picked it up and blew a blast. Uh, so loud and powerful that it uh, quite alarmed Krishna, who began to inquire as to who it was that could blow this Shankar. And of course, uh, there was a duel where uh, yeah, Neminath is shown much larger because of the, uh, I would say, um, hierarchical uh, you know, consideration. Because uh, in, ev uh, in most of the illustrations, you will find that the Thankar is shown much larger as compared to the other figures which are present in the painting. Okay. <clears throat> and of course, Neminath was uh, declared the winner. And this narrative also draws upon the, you know, uh, upon the need of showing the uh, superiority of the uh, Jain Tirthankars or the gods, etc. And uh, showing the other gods, say Krishna or Indra, in a subservient position in the uh, religious hierarchy in order to establish uh, their supremacy. Hmm. Okay. And then, of course, uh, Krishna, uh, you know, uh, when he finds out that uh, it was uh, Neminath, he becomes jealous of him as a rival and he directs his uh, wives and gopis to incite amorous or, you know, lovable thoughts in Neminath and shame him into marriage thinking uh, some kind of, uh, this kind of activity uh, with women would decrease his strength. So, of course, here you can see a water body, a pond where, uh, you know, there is, uh, you know, Jal Krida, which is happening between the two, Krishna and Neminath. And there are gopis and uh, other uh, women. In this, there are only two. There are some paintings where there are a whole lot of women which are there, shown persuading. Uh, Neminath into getting married here. Uh, sorry, this is not such a great picture. Huh? No. Let me remove this. Okay. So, this is scene of Neminath, very, very popular. No. Uh, Krishna selected Rajmati, the daughter of Ugrisen of uh, uh, Girnar, as his bride, uh, you know, whose palace is, of course, still shown being a ruin near the Junagad. Huh? No. For Junagad Fort ke pas mein hai, beside the Bhumiya Kuo. That's the space and that's the place where it is present. So this is on his wedding day. Neminath is approaching the assembly, wedding assembly, and saw that the animals here huh, are, to, uh, you know, they are enclosed in a very big uh, fence. And of course, upon inquiry, he's told that all these animals are going to be slaughtered for the big wedding feast that is going to uh, follow the uh, wedding rituals. And of course, the sheep and the other animals were bleating very, very piteously. And uh, seeing all this, Neminath became struck with uh, compassion uh, for them and disgusted at uh, uh, human vanity, I would say. He left the wedding, became an ascetic and retired into the uh, Girnar hills. And of course, he was followed by his uh, intended bride, because the wedding never took place. And here you can see he has directed his chariot in the opposite direction. So here it is arriving towards the wedding pavilion where his bride is sitting waiting for him. And here, after having seen this, he's moving away from the wedding pavilion. And of course, his wife also followed him. And there on the hills, uh, they led a very... Um, I would say, platonic life. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is also the same scene. The only difference being, some texts say that, of course, Neminath approached the wedding pav pavilion or he was traveling on an elephant. So here you can see an elephant on whom Neminath is, you know, seated riding. 
but at the same time his reversal of course from the scene is again on a horse chariot here which is shown here okay then there are some scenes from uh, Adinath, uh, you know, uh, the very first Tirthankar. Uh, of course, his brother Bharat, I, I think I showed you some images uh, from sculptures earlier. All right. So, of course, the first dream that Marudevi, his mother, had was that of a bull entering, uh, you know, uh, his uh, entering her mouth. All right. And uh, mothers of other Tirthankar saw an elephant first. So other occurrences were also uh, almost the same in the life of Mahavir. That was, you know, same as the Rishabh Nath also, but with one difference. Uh, Nabi, his father, uh, did not send for the dream diviners because he divined the dreams himself. He was so, he was uh, qualified to do that. You know? So here you can see coronation of Adinath. And the art of pottery making here, you can see in this particular folio here. And this is another uh, manuscript uh, depicting the same scenes. Uh, he's supposed to be the first king whose coronation is often depicted in the manuscripts. Uh, Rishabhnath was a man of skill, it is said. During his period, he taught the his subjects the uh, 72 arts of which Mathematics is the chief art. The list of these arts begin with the art of writing, ends with the art of understanding bird calls. He also taught the 64 womanly accomplishments, the 100 skills and the three occupations. Okay. And of course, uh, here you can see uh, Rishabh Nath again on an elephant. All right. And of course, he left his palace in search of knowledge in the um, Palki called Sudarshana. No? In this here, he's shown as a craft teacher, you know, making a pot, riding on an elephant. And again, here you can see the coronation. And very interestingly, he also was responsible for the for introduction of the in institution of marriage, whether you like it or you don't like it. And hence, a lot of miniatures are seen in which uh, Adinath has been shown in the a marriage pavilion. Huh, no? And this pavilion, again, uh, looks very much like the, you know, wedding, uh, you know, uh, mandapas that we see in today's life also. Similarly, the kalash and the uh, mango leaves, the, you know, banana leaves, etc., etc. Hmm. And after renouncing the world in search of knowledge and after his prolonged fast, Adinath's first ahar was ikshuras. Na? Ikshu uh, is the sugar cane juice offered to him by King Shreyansa's court. Na? And this is uh, today celebrated as uh, Akshetritiya also. As I was saying that uh, <clears throat> most of the illustrations in Jan manuscripts, they are concerned with Jincharit section of Kalpsutra, which tells the lives of the 24 Jinas. The story first speaks of Mahavi's life, then the next, uh, the you know, other three I spoke about, uh, namely Parshanath, Neminath, and Adinath. And uh, uh, then it goes on to say that uh, the similar things happened in the lives of other 20 Tirthankars. In fact, the text becomes uh, very compressed, and this compression may account for the uh, doubling of scenes in many of the uh, later illustrations in uh, some manuscripts. Okay, so here we are looking at two frames, yeah, whereby uh, the remaining 20 Tirthankars are being shown here, huh? 10 this side and 10 this side. It's part of uh, one big folio. Hmm. And here in another manuscript, you can see all the 20 uh, Tirthankars remaining here in one frame only. Hmm. And then the uh, second part of the Kalp Sutra is Sthavir Vali. Sthavir Vali, Sthavir. This section, of course, as the name indicates, contains a genealogy of prominent Jain teachers. The list begins with immediate uh, disciple of Mahavir. The last teacher to be mentioned is to be, is Devardhi Gani, Kshamakshaman. Hana? The first one is, about, of course, the Gautam Gani. And after recording the names of immediate uh, disciples called the Gandhars, uh, also talks about, uh, you know, 
they, their forming of the nine ganas since uh, four of the disciples form two pairs. That's why there are, uh, uh, you know, nine gandhars, uh, sorry, 11 gandhars and uh, nine ganas which were formed. Okay, fine. <clears throat> so here you can see uh, Gandhar chief Indrabhuti or Gautam Swami preaching in the center. He's sitting here. And uh, Gana is, of course, a specific group or congregation of monks or sadhus. And Gandhar is a principal disciple of a Tirthankar. As I said, he leads and looks after the Gana. And who are Ganis? Uh, a teacher who acts as the chief of a group of monks. A Gani may alternatively be also a person who teaches the Jain canon and other uh, scholarly disciplines to the monks. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, this is the last folio of a manuscript called the Colophon, which is also showing the uh, date of its execution. If you look closely here, Samvat 1530. Do you read this? So when they say Sambat, it means Vikram Sambat, 1530, which if you subtract 57, you will arrive at the current uh, you know, era, which is 1473. Okay. So this lineage consists of Gandhars followed by the examples of the uh, Bhagwan Mahavir. Okay. <clears throat> so the, of course, Gandhars followed the uh, uh, Mahavir and then their... Uh, Ganis followed the Gandhars and then, of course, uh, <clears throat> all the lay people, the, the fourfold religion, as it is called, the Sangha, the, uh, <clears throat> the monks, the nuns, the female devotees and the male devotees. Hana. So this is where you, you are looking at a uh, uh, monk. Here, Sthapnachari is there. His Mupati is in his hand, which means he is in the a process of delivering a lecture or a discourse. There is a, a disciple or a pupil sitting here. And here you can see the remaining part of the uh, Sangha. I know. Okay. <clears throat> so I think with this, we are going to end today's session. Uh, yeah. Right. And uh, the... Uh, the influence of the later paintings of Mughal paintings, I will show you probably in my next lecture. All right. And when we will also discuss about uh, Kalp Sutra only, but from uh, different regions like Mandu, Jaunpur, etc. Okay. So I think with this, I'm going to give Viram to today's lecture. And uh, now we are going to be open for any kind of uh, discussions or uh, Sure. Doubts, etc. Yeah. Ah, so hai to prashna puch sakte hain. Suvarna Jain so wants to talk that. Ah, aapka haath upar tha. Ab bataiye. Suvarna Jain has a question, I think. Hello, Jaijinendra, ma'am. Jaijinendra. Ma'am, uh, very nice lecture. Uh, I really liked uh, your detailed explanation for each folio. Uh, about what it illustrates. Uh, I have one query that uh, when uh, you say that this is a, a same about the same uh, occasion, another folio uh, you say. So uh, were they replicated these manuscripts, these paintings? Yes, were yes. very much. As I told you right in the beginning of this lecture, no, there were hundreds of copies of Kalp Sutra that were made. Some were illustrated, some were not illustrated, right? But, uh, of course, the illustrations, the same artist is not going to accomplish, uh, you know, such a huge task. So there were different artists, the painters who were employed in the services. And that's why you see different hands. And although the theme remains the same, uh, the <clears throat> they follow the exact uh, canons of, uh, you know, Jain paintings. But... At the same time, uh, there are differences that you can see between uh, different paintings uh, depicting the uh, same episode or the same story. Yeah, definitely. 
yes ma'am actually uh, rather than a difference like difference is very uh, less it was more of similarity with expression absolutely you're absolutely right because i think the very first lecture and since then i have been you know emphasizing on this point that uh, whatever uh, peculiarity that we see in gen paintings there it is not it was the art of that period you know when this uh, whole art started during the palm leaf period i was talking about 11th i mean uh, not uh, 11 i would say a uh, 12th century you know uh, early 12th century or late 11th century so it was not only gen paintings huh? there were other i showed you bal gopal stuti also i showed you vasant vilas secular paintings also uh you know texts not uh, which were illustrated texts like kalp sutra is a text you no know, which is which has illustration similarly bal gopal stuti is a hindu text but the illustrations in that was were also done in a similar fashion with this further eye uh, pointed nose three fourth profile etc etc but <clears throat> while these other uh, you know uh, traditions hindu traditions buddhist traditions etc or the secular chaur panchashika etc they moved away from you know this kind of presentation jain paintings continued this particular tradition for a very long time i'm showing you paintings of 15th century you know so almost <clears throat> i would say uh, late 16th century or middle of 16th century we will see paintings probably if i can show you right now also it will Uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, let me just show you that you know that will uh, actually remove your doubt you know let me see if i can okay these are i will uh, yeah yeah look at this painting yeah a complete uh, i would say uh, uh, if i had not told you it is from uh, uh, kalp sutra uh you would never have known this that it is a jain painting there's a total transformation hai na okay look at this one and uh, we know this from here also see in the uh, here you can see devananda brahmani ha huh? you can see rishabdat is sitting here devananda is sitting here some more yeah you can see harin gamesh and look at their costumes ha huh? they are wearing jamas and pyjamas ha huh? rather than dhotis right here you can see transfer of embryo happening right so this is the kind of difference uh, that uh, came about later on ha huh? na with the advent of uh, mughal paintings so this is the kind of changes uh that three fourth profile has come into complete profile where is that uh, eye which was hanging in the air it has totally disappeared no pointed nose hai na so and the costumes of course they have changed totally here right <clears throat> so this is what i meant when i said that uh the jain paintings of gujarat of that i mean for the longest time they followed the same canon same traditions and they there were no uh, peculiar or you know significant changes that came about during that period it was much much later right okay so i'm going to stop share now <clears throat> okay uh, does that answer your question Uh, yes ma'am uh, so i just wanted to know that uh, right like you said this is a part of the same kalpa sutra the the paintings which you shared right now uh, so but then they they looked like very much like mogul paintings and uh, so okay when i say part of the same kalp sutra i mean the text ha na kalp sutra text ab jaise aap dekhiye um से रामचरित मानस है ना या रामायण को देख लीजिए रामानंद सागर ने जो कुछ साल पहले बनाई थी उसमें और अब जो टेलीवाइज हो रहा है उसमें थोड़ा फर्क है ना ठीक है ना लेकिन टेक्स्ट तो वही रह रहा है ना रामायण ही है या रामचरित मानस ही है टेक्स्ट तो तो मेरा मतलब वही है कि ये पेंटिंग्स जो मैंने बाद में दिखाई है वो भी कल्प से ही है सेम टेक्स्ट है I don't mean the same manuscript. 
okay okay got it ma'am got it yeah okay yeah and ma'am like uh, in most of the uh, paintings there were almost four colors which were used like red blue uh, gold gold black yes and so <clears throat> so this is also one of the characteristics of jain paintings that mostly <clears throat> primary colors are used no mixing is there that isliye main bar bar bolti rehti na there is no plasticity or modeling jab aap हाफ टोन कलर्स दिखाएंगे तभी कुछ डेप्थ आती है ना पेंटिंग में प्राइमरी uh, कलर्स में दिखाएंगे तो ऐसे लगता है सम चाइल्ड हैज डन देम है ना सो दिस वाज वन ऑफ द दिस इज हाउ इट स्टार्टेड एंड जैन आर्टिस्ट हैड टू स्टिक टू दिस पर्टिकुलर नॉर्म एंड व्हेन यू टॉक अबाउट गोल्ड एंड ब्लू ब्लू इज द लैपिस लेजुली व्हिच वाज बीइंग ब्रॉट बाय यू नो नॉट क्लोज बाय प्लेस फ्रॉम अफगानिस्तान व्हिच वाज वेरी वेरी a uh, precious you know a uh, stone so yeah. i was saying i think i had mentioned earlier that in jain religion whether you donate for erecting a temple or a sculpture or you donate towards making of a manuscript or illustration the religious merit ya punya jo aap kamate hain usse it is the same right i think i mentioned this earlier so there were lot of donations which were being received in the making of these manuscripts or illustrations and for this reason whole lot of gold or lapis was being used in the decoration of these particular yes. illustrations and that's why you find gold sometimes the entire background would be covered with gold leaf and then the figures would be made on top of that or sometimes the body color would be made Uh, you know of gold color right and this was the reason that you see these colors very often and in fact this is uh, i would say <clears throat> uh middle middle of 15th century or uh, i mean from 14 uh, 40 or 1430 to almost um uh, last quarter of 15th century i would say this is also considered as the very opulent period of jain paintings that's why we see such highly uh, decorated paintings with lapis lazuli and uh, gold yeah yes ma'am the color scheme is so okay, beautiful yeah. everywhere yes ma'am jai jai doshi jai doshi wants to ask uh, a question uh, ma'am yes. mera ek question hai ki uh, nat uh, samav sharan mein natyashalae bhi thi to us paintings milti hai kya manuscript se ya kuch uh yeah some manuscripts uh, i would say uh, not in uh, manuscript paintings but i would definitely say some of the mural paintings or where you know or the cloth put you know there you will find where the uh, dimension of the canvas or the space which is provided to the artist was much much bigger as i was saying these manuscript folios are you know this very very small you know almost i would say 3 3 to 4 inches wide so there is a lot of uh, you know paucity of space and not every detail can be shown right yeah thank you ma'am yeah okay is there any other और और किसी को कोई जिज्ञासा हो तो पूछ सकते हैं देयर इज अ क्वेश्चन इन चैट डू वैष्णवाज इन अदर सेक्ट्स आल्सो मेंटेन्ड ज्ञान भंडार सिमिलर टू जैन इफ यस आर दे स्टिल एग्जिस्टिंग सो इट इज इंटरेस्टिंग दैट यू आस्क इट इज वेरी वेरी यूनिक टू जैन भंडार्स एंड आई थिंक आई स्पोक अबाउट दिस अर्लियर एट द टाइम ऑफ कुमार पाल द सोलंकी किंग you know he was so overwhelmed by this very uh, <clears throat> thought of creating libraries in patan his capital itself there were uh, many libraries and all over gujarat rajasthan and uh, they were considered very very auspicious and very sacred because you see jain religion the main emphasis is given on knowledge and jain granth are okay. directly related to acquiring knowledge yeah. Yeah. you know as much as that the sthapnacharya hello please mute yeah okay it's uh, the sthapnacharya the stand on which these 
uh, you know, manuscripts or the granthas are kept, they are also considered to be very holy. And it is, we owe a lot to this institution of Jain Bhandars or libraries, where these texts have been, you know, kept very, very securely, and they have been aired, they have been put, you know, with a lot of natural disinfectants, etc., so that the moths and, you know, other microbes, uh, you know, do not attack them. And even today, they are available for uh, people to come and study or scholars to, uh, you know, do further research. And mind you, while talking about Jain Bhandars, uh, the, you know, rigor was so much that it was these Bhandars or libraries did not only store Jain Granthas, all kinds of Granthas, Persian, Hindu, etc., all kinds of translations, secular works, whatever that the, you know, they were called the Bhattarakas, you know, who used to take care of these Jain Bhandars. And they would, uh, you know, there was a lot of competition between different libraries as to whose uh, collection is uh, more, you know, wide and, uh, you know, more eclectic in that sense. Yeah. So it is very unique to uh, Jain libraries or Bhandars. Of course, there were other libraries, but none of them could match the, you know, the vastness or the, you know, the number of libraries that the uh, Jains had built. Yes. Mr. Saurabh Jain, hello. Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Thank you so much for answering the previous question. Yes. Uh, I have one more question. Okay. Uh, which is with regard to what do we know about the condition of these scribes of uh, of the painters and the scribes who were working to create these work? Yeah. What I didn't understand. When you say Mitlab, what do we know about their conditions? Uh, do we have any details about how they were paid? Or very uh, little is known about their personal lives. Uh, although some names we do encounter in the colophon, when I said colophon, the last page of the manuscript, which will talk about the calligrapher. Calligrapher is somebody who's writing and the artist who is doing the uh, illustrations. Okay. And besides that, very little is known. Uh, but some texts do talk about them, but not at very great detail. Also, one more thing I want to point out about Indian art, uh, especially when it comes to calligraphers or, and artists also, it is, they do it with the, uh, you know, uh, with a lot of, uh, you know, what do you say, venerance, you know? and uh, it is as if it is there, it, uh, they are offering their services to the Lord or the God, all right, whereby it is, they are not uh, uh, doing it as a uh, mere uh, profession, all right, as similarly on Hindu temples or sculptures also. And in fact, the earlier paintings, uh, Bal Gopal Suti or any Bhagavad Puran or Ramayan for that matter, the earlier manuscript paintings in Hindu sect also, you will rarely find the artists' names because they do not claim any authorship of the uh, artwork that they have created because what they feel that this is their offering to the gods, right? And that's also one reason that uh, most of the, uh, you know, earlier Indian art is, you know, devoid of any kind of uh, artist's uh, signatures or names. Yeah, it's a very, very later concept that we, you know, find. Some of the Hoysala sculptures we will find uh, the names are written or the guilds, the names of the guilds, you know, to which the artist belonged or the sculptor belonged, though the name of those guilds are written. Yeah. Also, ma'am, uh, do uh, they were creating these art pieces? So do they know about the the context? For example, if someone is creating paintings of Nemina Charitra, 
does the artist know what he is painting uh, i would uh, presume yes i would presume and i think i showed you one folio one an incomplete folio earlier you know where the text was written and an empty space was left and in the you know border in the um, there was a you know thumbnail where, where it was written that what image has to come here all right so i would presume the artist was well versed with the uh, knowledge of the episode and only then could he do you know justice to what he was about to paint or illustrate right yeah thank you so much ma'am thank you so much but it is also true it is also true that uh, the artist and the scrib or the you know calligrapher they were two different people all right so uh, if we look at some of the you know shah nama uh, you know manuscripts you know shah nama manuscripts it's a persian manuscript which was uh, very very popular the longest manuscript i feel and which was illustrated in the in jaunpur region you know now the paintings if you see in that shahnama they are totally of jain style i will show you in my later lectures when we talk about kalkachari katha you know aapko lagega ki jain artist nahi bana rakhe hain but the text is shahnama it's written in persian all right so there i will say that probably uh, the artist of course he was not very well versed with shahnama but definitely he was briefed about the context in which he was to paint that particular scene okay aur idi aur kisi ka aur koi sandeh ho anybody have any question okay okay ma'am uh, so yeah. kind of you for your wonderful and illuminating lecture thank you thank you Uh, क्योंकि बी एल आई इंस्टीट्यूट आपको कृतज्ञता ज्ञापन तो नहीं कर सकता क्योंकि आपका जो श्रम है और आपका जो योगदान है आ, आ, उसमें उसमें क्योंकि आई जस्ट आई कैन से ओनली इंक्रीडिबल इंक्रीडिबल नहीं नहीं सर आई डोंड्स टू एक्सप्लेन मैं uh, क्योंकि आपने जितने श्रम से फोलियो uh, दिखाए हैं क्योंकि अद्भुत है मैं तो देख रहा था कि कितने वंडरफुल पेंटिंग्स हैव शोन इन पेपर मैनस्क्रिप्ट क्योंकि आजकल uh, कोई कलाकार इतना uh, रंग नहीं दे सकता इवन अपने ऑयल पेंटिंग में भी इतना रंग नहीं दे सकता जितना कि वहां के कलाकारों ने उस समय के कलाकारों ने उसको चित्रित किया तो इस बियॉन्ड इमेजिनेशन तो मैं देयर इज वन क्वेश्चन हियर डज द एपिसोड वेयर महावीर स्वामी सबड्यूज द डेमी गॉड नॉट वायलेट द लॉ ऑफ नॉन वायलेंस सो लेट मी टेल यू दिस वाज द एपिसोड व्हेन ही वाज 8 इयर्स ओल्ड है ना ही वाज बोर्न इन अ क्षत्रिय क्लान एंड इफ यू लर्न अबाउट भरत एंड बाहुबली Huh? I had shown you, no, last time, wooden patli, where they were uh, yes, you know, yes, seated on chariots and they were, you know, shooting arrows. Is that not an act of uh, violence? So tell me, what should be the answer? But ma'am, they were not Tirthankaras. I huh? mean, they were not Tirthankaras. No, no. But you see, he is just an eight-year-old boy. He has not renounced. एंड क्षत्रिय धर्म क्या कहता है यू हैव टू यू नो गार्ड योर टेरिटरी है ना वो तो इवन टूडे यू सी आई थिंक इट वॉज हेमचंद्राचार्य एक्चुअली हु क्लासिफाइड डिफरेंट रूल्स फॉर द हाउस होल्डर्स देन वॉट यू नो जैन साधुज और मंग्स आर सपोज टू फॉलो वाई बिकॉज being a grahast or a householder it is not possible for you to follow uh, what are the rules for the monks or the sadhus similarly being a kshatriya who was who you, you are supposed to you know save your clan save your territories it can, i mean you cannot do it without 
uh, you know, uh, taking up weapons in your hands. All right. It was only once you have left this uh, world in search of knowledge, it is only after that, then, you know, uh, all uh, of uh, ahinsa or, or non-violence, all this will come into being in your life. I showed you the Neminath folio also. Anna? Okay. By then, Neminath had not become a Tirthankar. So for his wedding feast, of course, all those animals were going to get slaughtered. That would amount to Ahinsa. But that was the practice in the, you know, royal palaces. Right. Uh, I hope uh, I'm, I've made myself clear. Yeah. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Certainly. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Uh, let me conclude my. Yes, thank you. Sorry for I just read that last question. I no thought problem, I no yes, problem, but, no yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Jignasu, Jignasu, Kijo, Jignasa, eh? Go, Aki, Vyakan, may it read a lean hoge, eh? Unki, Sunday, joy, hex, eh? Over, eh? Like, show down, kiss, and kya come, eh? Like in Ham, Sanka, for me, that the hem, yeah, 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 absolutely. गुणवत्ता पर जाते हैं तो आप क्या वो वो आपकी महिमा है जो आपकी व्याख्यान में जो गुणवत्ता है तो उसी का ये परिणाम है कि जिज्ञासाओं की जिज्ञासा खत्म हो रही है तो आ, मैं अपने संस्थान के ओर से और निदेशक जी के ओर से उपस्थित सभी हमारे विद्वजनों के ओर से आपको बहुत-बहुत आभार प्रकट करता हूं जो अगले व्याख्यान में हम फिर सब मिलेंगे 